After having covered the rise of the Aztec Empire, it's time we take a closer look at its crown jewel, the massive capital of Tenochtitlan. This marvel of Mesoamerican urban development is woefully underappreciated, and it will be my goal today to get you acquainted with its amazing story and layout. Tenochtitlan was founded in 1325 upon an unclaimed marshy island in Lake Texcoco. According to legend, the very spot was marked by the god Huitzilopochtli, who had told the Mexica tribe to seek out an eagle perched on a prickly cactus. A second city was also founded 13 years later by a group of dissident Mexica who set up camp on a twin island just a few hundred meters to the north. This second location would become known as Tlatelolco. At first, both settlements were quite unremarkable as there were meager building supplies in the area and people had to survive off the local flora and fauna of the lake. However, due to their position, they could exploit waterborne travel to grow as raiders and traders. Over the decades, the two population centers were able to expand thanks to extensive drainage and construction projects, such as the famed Chinampas. Due to their close proximity though, the two groups were quite closely intertwined and often worked, traded, and fought together. During the uprising of 1426, both Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco would lock arms to take on the city of Azcapotzalco along with their other two allies in the Triple Alliance. During the following years of the Aztec Empire, both cities would get their share of tribute, plunder, and economic activity that would cause them to expand rapidly. While growth would see their cityscapes merge, the two did seek to preserve their own identity. A quick comparison would reveal that Tenochtitlan had the greater area and population, though Tlatelolco had by far the largest market and main temple. Another further distinction would be their individual rulers, as both cities maintained separate governments. For context, here are both of their royal lineages side by side. You'll note that the Tlatelolco line ends in 1473. This is due to the fact that a family quarrel between rulers escalated into open conflict and saw Tenochtitlan emerge victorious and assert its dominance over Tlatelolco. Thus, from then on, the two cities would formally be joined up until their conquest in 1521 by the Spanish and their allies. Let's now turn to the details of the cityscape itself. This can be a bit overwhelming, so let's first begin by looking at things from a macro level before zooming in to deal with the specifics. To put things simply, the city was located on an island on the western edge of Lake Texcoco and was connected to the mainland by five great causeways. It covered 13 square kilometers and was laid out in a dense grid of canals, roads, and buildings. The city was divided into four quarters, known as Campan. These were then further subdivided into 15 or so districts, known as Calpoli. Each of these districts held commoner families led by a set of nobles, with their own marketplace, temple, and school. With this framework in mind, let's now begin filling in the details of the city. We can begin with the most important ceremonial center of Tenochtitlan, the sacred precinct. This walled area encapsulated a wide plaza holding about a dozen important structures. Dominating the center was the 60 meter tall twin peaked great temple with a blue shrine dedicated to Tlaloc and a red shrine dedicated to Huitzilopochtli. In front of it lay the round temple pyramid of Quetzalcoatl. A variety of other temples, a ball court and even a school for nobles were arrayed around the remaining ground of the sacred precinct. Just outside the walls were a host of other important buildings used to run the city. These included palaces, homes for dignitaries, marketplaces, and yet more temples. At this point, we would be remiss to skip over some of the incredible features of Motecozoma II's palace, which included a botanical garden, an aviary, a zoo, and even an aquarium. Spanish chroniclers report that the botanical garden contained a great many trees, sweet-scented flowers, and aromatic herbs, which were a pleasure to stroll besides. The aviary is said to have had 10 rooms housing many colorful species and birds of prey. The zoo featured jaguars, pumas, foxes, and snakes, amongst hundreds of other exotic animals, while the aquarium housed yet more creatures in the form of salt and freshwater fish located in separate ponds. This is truly something that must have been incredible to behold. Radiating out from the cluster of buildings around the sacred precinct were four major roads. The east led to the docks of Tetamozalco while the north, south, and west led to the great causeways of Tacuba, Iztapalapa, and Tepeyac, leading to the mainland. These were built to accommodate heavy traffic and were so wide that the Spanish noted you could fit 10 horses side by side. 
Along each of these major highways were located many of the larger city buildings with a series of gates and drawbridges located at the entrances to the city. Co-located with the causeways were also aqueducts, which brought in fresh water from springs on the mainland. These were lined with terracotta bricks and came in paired ducts, such that repairs could take place on one or the other in order to minimize total downtime. I'll also note that water management was a huge focus for the Aztecs, and something they excelled at. As a prime example, the 17-kilometer-long dike of Nezahua Coyote separated the fresher western Texcoco from the more brackish eastern Texcoco, while also contributing significantly to the dike system for regulating water level around the city. Another important landmark to point out is to the north, in Tlatelolco. As was stated before, it had once been its own city, and therefore still contained many of the same plazas, temples, and palaces as its southern neighbor. But what really stands out is the marketplace of Tlatelolco, which was the largest in the American continent. Cortez reports that it could hold as many as 60,000 people. These buyers and sellers would go about their business in an immense open-aired market with goods organized by areas and rows. One might find corn, tomatoes, feathers, rare animal pelts, musical instruments, fine cloth, and even bottled fresh water, amongst other things. These were bartered for using cacao, cotton cloaks, and gold-filled feather quills. There would have been a ton more to explore in the city, but for now we will have to fill up the remaining blanks with some high-level commentary. You can imagine that much of the rest of the cityscape was filled with canals, bridges, streets, squares, markets, temples, workshops, and residences. You'd find tons of homes traditionally built of adobe walls and thatch roofs. Colorful frescoes and other decorations filled one's vision with color, while countless people going about on foot and by boat breathed life into the scene. These included farmers, fishermen, merchants, nobles, priests, craftsmen, soldiers, and more. For context and the sheer level of activity, the population at its peak is estimated to have been in excess of 200,000 individuals, with the surrounding small towns pushing the total closer to 300,000. This is astounding, and must have been particularly impressive to the Spaniards, as the sheer scale of Tenochtitlan rivaled many of the largest contemporary European cities such as Paris. At this point, I also want to clear up a misconception about the Mesoamericans. Often they are imagined as being largely made up of unsophisticated tribes scattered across the jungles. In reality, theirs was a civilization of centralized city-states with impressive levels of development. After all, Tenochtitlan was just one shining jewel among many. It's hard to wrap my head around what a sight this all must have been to behold. I'd love to talk more about the various details of Tenochtitlan and other Mesoamerican cities, but for now, this is where we will leave things. I look forward to reading the comments below to see what you all would like to focus on next. Once again, thanks for all your support and feedback, and a lot of the comments in the last video were really helpful and helped prompt me to do this particular video. So with that being said, see you in the next one.